Our Heavenly Father, what an amazing thing to be able to call you that, mm -hmm. to address you as Father, something that we do not see not one time in the Old Testament scriptures. Your people, your people of faith, did not address you as such, with such familiarity, until your son taught us how. So we are very appreciative of the intimacy that is ours because of him. As we look at your word this evening, we ask that you would open up our hearts and our ears and may the Holy Spirit be our teacher. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. All right. When last we met, we were in Genesis 24. No. 14. 14. 14. Just checking. There's no way we would we would go through Genesis and skip Genesis chapter 22. You know, in Galatians uh, 3, 8, I think it is, the Bible says that Abraham was given the gospel beforehand. And you go, I wonder where that was. It's in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22 is where Abraham reckoned by faith, reckoned Abraham or Isaac to be dead. And that God would have to raise him from the dead because he was the promised son. And the Bible goes on to say, and um, figuratively speaking, that's exactly what happened. So, Genesis chapter 22. I hope you guys do that. It'll be an amazing, an amazing lesson. It normally takes me about four sessions to get through that chapter. But we'll try and scoot through a little bit. Okay, Genesis 14. The issue here in this chapter is the invasion of Canaan by four Babylonian kings, and they are taking on five Canaanite kings, for lack of a better term. And they have done whatever it is they want to do. They have squelched the rebellion, and Cater Leomer is on his, his um, way back home. And I get the feeling he's hightailing it, uh, because Abraham and his friends and God have routed those four kings. And at least two of the armies have been decimated. And the other two are hightailing out of town. And in the process of all this, our beloved Lot <clears throat> has been taken captive and his family and all of his possessions and Abraham's intent is to go get him, go fetch him, get him back from these um, four, four kings and he does so. He and God are successful in this endeavor. And we pick up the story in verses 19 and 20. Now the character that we have been introduced to is Melchizedek. And whether you believe he is a Christophany or not is up for grabs. But the thing that is common between those two camps is that Melchizedek is a type of Jesus Christ. Only, 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 only Jesus Melchizedek and the New Testament believer have been permitted to be both priests and kings. And so Melchizedek by way of type and you and I by way of heritage. 
So verses 19 and 20, and he, Melchizedek, blessed him, Abram, and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, a tithe of all. The word tithe means a tenth. The lesson here is not about tithing. This is not the passage used to teach tithing. There was no commandment for Abram to do this. This was a one-time event. You will not read of Abram doing this again. And thirdly, he was not tithing from his income he was tithing from the spoils of war. So if you're going to teach tithing, you need to find another stake in the ground, in my opinion. And if you looked at what the Jewish people were actually required to give of their incomes, it was more in line with what we pay in taxes today. If you consider that they left the ground fallow, were supposed to leave the ground fallow every seventh year. They were not permitted to harvest the same field twice. Whatever they missed was intentionally left behind for the poor and the homeless. They were not allowed to harvest the corners of their fields. Those were left purposely for the poor and the homeless. There were many other things that that were required from the Jewish people that ran up to about 35% of their income. And that 35% of their income mainly went to the Levites for the upkeep of the temple and the tabernacle, for the wages of the Levites, you see, the Levites, this is this whole Passover thing that's spoken of in Exodus. And although God spared the firstborn of every house that had the blood, if you weren't covered by the blood, you, you were going to lose your firstborn. And the, and, the, and the scriptures say there was not a single home in all of Egypt, which at that time was the entire known world, over there there's not a single home in the entire land of Egypt that did not lose somebody to this plague so this is that whole Passover thing and although in the land of Goshen where the Israelites lived if you if 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 you had the blood and you were covered by the blood the death angel would pass over that home and you would be saved or spared. But that did not entirely let you off the hook. For your, for your eldest, your firstborn in that home belonged to God and must and had to be redeemed. And the redemption price, I believe, was five shekels of silver. And this is why, this is what God did with the Levites. And so he said, the Levites are mine. And I will take them in payment for the firstborn. And he did a count. And he said, you all are short. I counted 2,400 <laughs> Levites. <clears throat> and you're, sh you're short a couple hundred. And so those had to be redeemed with the five shekels of silver and only silver. So silver is emblematic of redemption. Bronze is emblematic of judgment. Gold is emblematic of deity. Wood is emblematic of Christ in his humanity. <clears throat> so, and all of that like Melchizedek, all of that was a picture 
of the <coughs> Passover. That's a definite article. Not a Passover, because there were many Passovers. In fact, the nation of Israel was required to observe the Passover every year. And the youngest in the family, and Mark, you correct me anytime I go astray here, but it was the, at the Seder, it was the youngest, youngest, I believe it was the son's, youngest son's responsibility to ask the questions that caused the teaching from the eldest, usually the dad, maybe the grandpa, the patriarch of the family. Why are we doing this? And it, and it had to do with this event whereby God not only saved his people from 400 or 430 years of bondage in Egypt, but he also used this event to plunder the country. His people left with silver and gold and bronze and wood and cloth and gold and silver um, thread and you name it huge herds and we are talking God told he said every every one of you talk to your neighbor and ask your neighbor for stuff and I will make them pleasantly inclined toward you and they will empty you their pockets and thus God plundered Egypt so says the text so this Passover thing was more than just getting out of Dodge. It was 400 years of back wages. All right. So until we get to the Passover lamb, all of this was emblematic of Jesus and his one and only Passover um, ceremony. He was crucified once and once for all. There, are, there have been no legitimate Passover lambs since Jesus Christ. Because all of the Old Testament writings pointed to that event. And so in the in the teaching and talking about Melchizedek, he is a type of that which will come and that which will come will be the priest the prophet and the king namely Jesus the Christ okay and so <clears throat> the Bible talks about taking us out of Egypt as a type and the world is cast as Egypt and when we came out of Egypt through the shed blood of the Passover lamb, we did not come out poor. We have, we have whether, whether, whether we know this or not, we have plundered the kingdom from which we were saved. Our father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. He has given us everything we need for life and godliness. My Bible says we have the mind of Christ, which means many of us, me included, have to take it off the shelf and dust it off and use it once in a while, right? So we have, we, we did not come out of this poor. But our riches, like a lot of what was promised to Abraham, are not to be seen in our lifetime. They're only to be seen on the other side of death. This is sometimes what makes it hard. Because we want it now. So, the fact that Abram gave a tenth of the spoils. And by the rules of engagement in that period in time, 
the spoils of war belonged to Abram. Every person, every dollar, every animal, every scrap of clothing was legally his as the spoils of war. This is important for us to understand as we see what transpires throughout the rest of this chapter. Abram gave a tenth of the spoils of war to Melchizedek. He could not have done that legitimately or legally had they not belonged to him. You cannot give a gift that you do not own. So, when we talk about everlasting life as a gift, when we talk about the grace of God as a gift, be sure that the giver paid for that gift to make it his own prior to giving it away. And we know what the cost was. So the fact that Abram gives to Melchizedek means that Abram is less than Melchizedek. The lesser gives to the greater. Then you'll see the reciprocate of that when Melchizedek blesses Abram. The greater always blesses the lesser. And so there you have in this chapter established the hierarchy with Melchizedek and Abram. And later on in the New Testament, Jesus Christ and Abraham. And this is the first three chapters of Romans. Is Paul trying to get, get it through the heads of his own people? Our father's Abraham. No. 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 Because Abraham... My Lord said to, the Lord said to my Lord, right? Abraham is the lesser. Okay, so any questions so far? You said uh, silver, emblematic of redemption, gold of deity, bronze was what, and wood was what? Bronze is judgment. This is why the laver, the, the, the first altar that you encounter as you approach the tabernacle was the bronze altar. That's where judgment for your sins occurred. Next was the laver, also made out of bronze. And the laver is the only implement of the furniture for the tabernacle and the temple that did not have dimensions. Everything else was specific. And we think the idea behind that, so the labor was where you washed. The labor was where you were cleansed. The labor was where you were cleansed after you brought an acceptable sacrifice. And God accepted that sacrifice on the, on the coals of the brazen altar. And the sacrifice was for our sins. And, that, and, once, and once that sacrifice was accepted, we were expected to move closer to the presence of God and wash. Emblematic of our sins now having been cleansed. We are now cleansed. And the idea behind the labor not having any dimensions was that there were no limits to the cleansing. Okay? Yeah. Does that answer your question? Uh, you didn't answer the wood part. The wood is, is the humanity. So, and we won't spend a lot of time on this, but when you... When you look at the table of showbread, when you look at the altar of incense, when you look at the Ark of the Covenant, they were made of wood from the earth, emblematic of, God, of Christ's humanity, 
and they were always covered with gold, emblematic of his deity. But with the menorah and with the mercy seat, so we have to understand that the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat were two separate pieces of furniture. One was the chest and one was the lid. The menorah, which is emblematic of the Holy Spirit, it's also emblematic of Jesus Christ when he says, I am the light of the world. The menorah was the only light, was the only illumination within the, the tabernacle. Made of a special oil. It was solid gold, meaning there's no humanity involved in the Holy Spirit. And then you get to the mercy seat, it was a talent, about 75 pounds of solid gold, hammered out in one piece with two cherubs, with the lid that fit the ark, that covered the law, Aaron's rod, and the golden jar of manna. That was solid gold, indicating deity, possibly, more than likely, God the Father. Okay, so within the tabernacle, you have Jesus represented many times with wooden objects covered in gold. This is the vera dio vera homo, right? Very God and very man of Jesus Christ. I don't expect you to understand that because I don't. I don't know how that works. I just believe what God tells me. Did that help? All right. And then there were five coverings. And every, every covering was emblematic of something else. The innermost covering was fine white linen with thread of scarlet and gold. And the outer covering was debatable, probably maybe goat, maybe those rock, rock, um, you know, those hamster kind of things. Yeah, yeah, possibly. But, but, but it was emblematic of we beheld him and there was nothing comely about him as he hung on the cross. He was barely even recognizable as a man. He was, he was beaten so badly. And so, and so as you approach the <coughs> tabernacle, which was surrounded by a pristine white linen fence, there was nothing fantastic. There was nothing appealing that made you go, ooh, no, it was just a big tent. It was a big tent. And quite frankly, my tent looked better than that one. Until you get inside. Joe? The tabernacle is supposed to be mobile? Like, so Absolutely. Like carry on. And so Absolutely. When did, when did the tabernacle go away? And then what is it now? The, the, the tabernacle went away sometime after the conquest of Canaan. So they were more or less, and I do mean more or less, using the tabernacle until Solomon built the temple. And now God had a home. And a permit. Right. And dwell there. Yeah. Yeah. And the way the tabernacle worked is the Shekinah glory, which is a theophany. It's a visual manifestation of God. If the, if the Shekinah glory got up and moved, then they packed up the tent and they followed the cloud. And they stayed as long as the cloud stayed. And if the cloud got up and moved, they packed up the tent and they moved too. Right? And sometimes it was for a very short period of time, and sometimes it was for an extended period of time. Fire away. Probably a pretty basic question. I apologize. No, no, no. What does the word ark mean? Ark. Mm -hmm. So, ark is a Hebrew term meaning box. And it is a financial term. So, it is a square or rectangular box that bankers used to put their precious gold, silver, and coinage in. 
So it's a banking term. So I have to have the Noah's Ark, which is a gigantic boat. It's a box. It's, it's a box. gigantic box. Okay. The ark that was built for Moses when he was pushed out into the river was a box. Yeah. Good. And the dimensions of the ark have been, oh, I guess scientifically examined, and it, it is it is a it is a it is a vehicle of such proportion that it is almost impossible to capsize. So it's perfectly suited for bobbing along in whatever. Well, it didn't have a rudder. Where they were, where were they going? Right? Everything is covered in water. Where do you want to go? So anyway, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. And so as you examine the construction of the Ark of the Covenant, you will also find out that it is a rectangular box. All right? Okay, so here we go. Verses 21 through 22. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. Let me assure you, the king of Sodom had no right to the persons. They belonged to Abram. One commentator said this is the hiss of the serpent. Whereas Cater Leomer was the roar of the lion. He came to, he came to town to be heard. He came to town to subjugate these people. The king of Sodom is referred to by one commentator as the hiss of the serpent. It's just, it's, this is deceptive talk. You don't own the people. Abram did. You can't tell him that he can keep them. They belong to him. And once again, we see here that Abram very graciously acquiesced to that request. Otherwise, the king of Sodom would have nobody to be king over except the old, the young, and the infirm. And take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord. He has taken a solemn oath before God. The possessor of heaven and earth Verse 23, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap. I will have no strings attached between me and thee. So you will never say I made Abram rich. To God be the glory. All right. Now, mind you, the king of Sodom emblematic of the serpent is the first one to approach Abram. All right. Now, be sure that you understand the adversary that we fight today is described both as a serpent and as a lion. Let me reassure you that when Peter refers to him using the word lion, he also uses the word like. He's not lion. He is not a lion. He is not the lion. We serve the lion of Judah. He comes like a lion. He wishes he was the lion. He's been wishing he was God ever since. Abram refuses to be enriched by the king of Sodom. How could he think of delivering Lot from the power of the world if he himself were governed by it? He is not going to be beholding to the king of Sodom. And here we find the sad estate 
of the people of Sodom and that here God has delivered them and later God will burn them all up. Later they will die in the fires of judgment from heaven with the exception of four. It's interesting, don't you think? That when God brought judgment on the earth in Noah's day, there were eight that survived. And when God brought judgment on the earth in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, there were only four. And those, and those four had to be laid hands on and dragged out of town. Lot's testimony was such that he told his three sons-in-law, this is what's coming. And they went, yeah. And so the angel laid hold of Lot, his wife, and his two daughters and pulled them out of town. And the wife didn't make it, did she? Okay. Bruno de Lu preached a sermon about Genesis 14 years ago. His subject was the devil's shoelace. He argued that if we accept the shoelace, we get the boot too. And if we take the boot, we get the leg to which it is inserted. And if we take the leg, then we get the body of the devil that it belongs to. And, there, and thereby we have given the devil a foothold. It's just a shoelace. No, it's not. Well, we're just holding hands. No, you're not. You're getting prepared for sexual intercourse. Don't be deceived. Because that little boy you got a grip on isn't going to be satisfied very long just holding your hand. But you've opened the door. Now that sounds very Puritan in today's world. I get it. And I don't make any apologies for it. Verse 24, except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. So Abram makes two, two exceptions about the loot or the booty. And neither one of those exceptions enriches him personally. His first exception was for the men who went with him, who had to eat in order to sustain their strength. <clears throat> These are the 318 servants, or thereabouts, of the household of Abram. These servants did not take any of these spoils as they were his servants, and he was capable and authorized to speak for them. They will take nothing except the food they have already eaten. But these other three men who are my compatriots, they will take their share. And here again we see that Abraham is authorized to do this because he is giving away what belongs to him. Before leaving this chapter, there might be three observations we can make. This is the first and only place where Abram is viewed as a warrior. As a what? Warrior. Genesis 12 through 25 are the chapters that cover the life of Abram. This is the only chapter where God does not speak directly. However, however, he is represented by a priest. And here we have the outworking of the Abrahamic covenant. One of the facets of the Abrahamic covenant. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And so these four kings came with a militaristic agenda, and they received a militaristic agenda in return. 
and their battle plan was insufficient compared to God's. <coughs> Big shock there, right? Okay. Rick, I got a question. Fire away. How many times have there been a feast of God's most high come? How many times has there been a... Melchizedek? Well, it's certainly the first one I, I know of. Is it how many more? And I don't, well, I know I know there's at least two. Two. Right? Right. Yeah. Two. High. High. When you talk about priests. Of God most high. Well, we are priests of God most high. The term there is El Elyon. God most high. El Elyon. And so Melchizedek was the high priest of Jerusalem. He was the reigning priest of Jerusalem. And you said there was a second one? Who's the second one? Jesus Christ. Hmm. So there's only two in the club? Uh, that I know of, apart from you and I. <laughs> and then I noticed that he brought out bread and wine. Right. Why? To refresh Abram. Hmm. Guy's been at war. Now, some people will want to make, will want to read into that the Lord's Supper, which we just enjoyed this morning. I don't know how to do that. Well, maybe do the Passover, the Seder. Because the bread and wine, bread and wine represents Friday night dinner for me. Well, it also yeah. It represents on the Lord's Supper, the third cup. Yeah, but the, but the, the Passover has not occurred yet. No, I know. Doesn't mean it can't be a precursor to that. But I'm not prepared to lay that that tag on it. No, I was just wondering. Yeah, I'm not tagging. I just yeah. No, that's fine. I, I appreciate the, I appreciate every question. What about maybe Melchizedek? Since he's only one, right? And then Jesus is the other. Maybe the Holy Spirit wanted to come around and see what was going on first. Any ideas about that? Well, the Holy Spirit's always always been around. He's always been active. Yeah. Just Sure, absolutely. You have the triune Godhead at work here all throughout the Old Testament. And we talked about that in Genesis 1 1. It was your first intro introduction to the triune, the triunity of God. Any others? Okay, if something comes to mind, let me know. Genesis chapter 15. This is basically the ratification of the Abrahamic covenant, which has been spoken of numerous times prior to this chapter. After these things, after what things? After the things in chapter 14. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Now, mind you, this is the book of Genesis. And the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. So I'm not going to bother you with, well, this is the first time a priest is mentioned. This is the first time a vision is mentioned. Just the book is full of the firsts, all right? But this is the first time a vision. <laughs> all right, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Eleazar means helper. It is what Jesus spoke of when he was walking the earth in reference to the Holy Spirit. I will leave, I have to go, but I will send you another helper, another Eleazar. Verse 3, then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Which was not uncommon in that day and age to adopt a servant or a slave and make them the inheritor, the beneficiary. Verse 4, behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body will be your heir. 
Then he brought him outside the tent and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. Notice here that this vision occurs at night inside a tent because now he is instructed to come outside and look at the stars. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Verse 6. And he, Abram, believed in the Lord, and he, God, counted to him, Abram, for righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord, who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. I can only assume he put one on each side, possibly two on each side, two on one side, none on the other. I don't know. But the two birds were not cut in two or the two types of birds. I don't even know that part. And when the vultures came, we are going to talk about birds as messengers of Satan. When the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, this is the second sun going down. So this episode has covered a night, a day, and now we're into the second night. Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge after they shall come out with great possessions. This all occurs in the book of Exodus. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It mentions the Amorites by way of general, generalizing 10, I think, different people groups that we refer to as Canaanites. So the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down, it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river of Euphrates. The river of Egypt is not the Nile. It's a tributary. Had, had the great river been the Nile, they would have already been in the land that God promised them while they were in captivity in Egypt. The Kenites, the Kenanites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, Canaanites, Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So he names all these people. And at one time I, I thought, well, it's not good to have ite at the end of your, but then you get the Israelites and that shoots that theory, <laughs> right? All right, 15 verse one, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. This we think is the fourth time God has revealed himself to Abram but this time in a vision. Kind of like a dream, kind of like a trance, kind of like uh, being drugged with a drug that renders you unable to move, but leaves you conscious of what's going on around you. So I think. I've never had one. And after reading Abraham's deal, I'm not sure I ever want one. God gives two reasons for not fearing. Why was Abraham afraid? Common sense. 
Well, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, later on, right? He was suffering night terrors. That's why he's afraid. That and, the, that and the fact that, unlike our brothers on TV and radio who stand there and shave while talking to Jesus, you find people in the Bible when confronted with angels and the presence of the God wind up prone. They hit the dirt. These are, these are not the cherub-like things that Hallmark likes to put on your cards. These are fearsome creatures. These are living, sentient beings capable of killing 185,000 Assyrians in one afternoon. Over a 10-hour span, that's, that's, that's like 400 guys a minute. Yeah, there's, there's somebody to be feared. The Apostle John, who walked with Jesus Christ twice in the book of Revelation, hit the dirt in a form of worship when he was confronted with a mighty angel. And the mighty angel said, don't do that. Get up, for I am a fellow servant. If when you read of people hitting the dirt and offering worship to an angel, and the angel does not tell them to get up, you are probably in the presence of a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, because only Jesus is worthy of accepting any kind of worship from any of his creatures. So there's a, there's a clue. So God says, I am your shield. I am your divine protector. The word shield is only used once. In the entire New Testament, it's found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. And the shield there, by its Greek usage, is a door-sized shield. Not one of these little things you hold on your arm. This is a door-sized shield. The flaming darts of the evil one will not penetrate. God goes on to say, I am your very great reward. This phrase reads in the Hebrew, it could be taken in one of two different ways. The first option is that God himself is the reward. The second option is that Abram's reward would be very great. While the Hebrew allows for both, tra both translations as far as the end product is concerned, it does not matter, does it? God is his great reward. And as, and as such, he is an heir of God. Romans 8, verses, I think, 16 and 17, speaks to you and me as New Testament believers that we are both heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Does that sound like the same thing to you? It doesn't to me. And they are, they are, it's the same root word, it's the same legal term, but somewhat different in the second portion. And so the best I can do for you, until somebody smarter than I am corrects me, which is always possible, happens quite often she's sitting back there <laughs> to be an heir of God is to be a, a person of faith to be a person of faith is to be a person who has been justified by God Habakkuk 2 4 the just shall live by faith If you have been justified, that qualifies you to be an heir of God. All people of faith get an allotment of an inheritance. 
and it is the same across the board. Justification, ultimately glorification. Every believer enjoys fellowship with God. Every believer is no longer an object of wrath. Their condemnation, which is duly theirs, has been paid for. All people of faith inherit that. Old Testament saints, tribulation saints, millennial saints are all heirs of God. Well, all believers are the same, aren't they? No, they are not. We are heirs of God, so we get everything that every other person of faith gets. We are also joint heirs with Christ. Meaning, as the eldest, as the possessor of the blessing, as the possessor of the double portion, we get to share in his inheritance as well. Meaning, some of the benefits of being a joint heir with Christ is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We will rule and reign with him in the millennial kingdom. Who will we be ruling and reigning over? Other believers of both Jewish and Gentile ilk who have survived the judgment of the nations and entered the millennial kingdom. We are the body. We are the bride. We will be joined to the Son, which will be witnessed by the other inheritors, the other heirs of God. All believers of all nations will be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We are the New Testament Holy of Holies. God dwells here and he dwells there. That's part, only part of being a joint heir with Christ. That is not available to every believer. Now, maybe at some point in history, all of those lines will be blurred. I don't know. But as you read your Old Testament, you'll read people of faith, people like David, who begged God not to remove his spirit from him. See, in those days, the spirit came, and it came upon people. In the book of Exodus, it came upon certain craftsmen to enable them to pound out the menorah out of a solid piece of 75-pound gold. And when the job was done, the spirit moved on. You and I have the abiding Holy Spirit. He has set up residence in our heart and he promises never, ever, ever to leave. Part of being a joint heir with Christ. Okay, anyway, we'll get off that soapbox. Okay. Question. So you're saying that the tribulation saints and the millennial saints won't have the Holy Spirit? Like we do? Yeah. No, they won't. So they won't have it permanently? They might have it just every so often like you were saying? We, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. 
right? And when the church is complete, and I don't know when that is. Nobody knows when that is. When Jesus was walking the earth, he didn't know when that was. He said, only my father knows that. So when the last Jew or the last Gentile surrenders his heart to Jesus, and that individual completes the body and bride of Christ, we will be whisked out of here. The Greek word is harpazo. And it, and it relates to what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah when the angels laid hands on Lot and jerked him out of town. You and I will be jerked out of here. To which we say, now? Now? So when the body and bride is complete, and I don't know when that is, nobody does. If you find somebody who knows that answer, turn around and run away. All right? Then we will be removed. And we will be joined. We are betrothed. You know what that word means? Yeah, it means married without the consummation. All right? It's a legal, it took a legal contract of divorce to end a betrothment. We are betrothed. We are called a betrothed. We are promised to the Son. Not everybody can say that. Israel can't say that. The Old Testament refers to Israel as the bride or the wife of God. As the wife of God, she finds herself in the book of Revelation pregnant. Well, the virgin bride of Jesus Christ better not find herself pregnant or we got problems. We have worse problems in the church than we think we have now. So there are three women in the book of Revelation. The wife of God, the bride of Christ, and Jezebel. Okay. Uh, the whore. The harlot. Pardon my <laughs> French. So, William? So, uh, the Old Testament saints, as uh, the rapture happens, they will be the the dead will rise first, right? Right. So, but they are not rising as the bride of Christ, is it? Right. Okay. Just being clear. Right. We are so privileged. We are so blessed. Yes. We are doubly blessed. Why? Because we're joint heirs with Christ. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Verse 2 and 3, but Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. He, 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 is, look, he is looking at the situation. He is looking at the circumstances. We talked about that this morning. He's looking at the circumstances. I'm old. I'll tell you how old I am. The writer of Hebrews says it was as if he were dead, meaning incapable. And the wife I'm supposed to have this kid with, well, she's experienced menopause 30 years ago, so I don't know how that's going to work, but I believe you. I believe you can do it. I believe you will do it. Why? Because you promised it. Not because of any fancy schmancy miracle, but because God said. And if that is good enough for Abram, without the blue letter Bible, should be good enough for us, don't you think? Yeah. Jesus said it, I believe it, that settles it. Move on to the next question. 
Here is actually the first dialogue between Abram and God. God has spoken, and Abraham has spoken, but now here they're speaking. Abram revealed what his fear actually was. What will you give me, seeing I go childless? Materially speaking, Abram had enough prosperity. What he lacked was posterity. I don't know how you're going to pull this off, but it looks to me like Eleazar is going to inherit. God says, "No, he ain't. You're going to have. You're going to have. You're going to have. You are. You are going to have the seed son spoken of in Genesis chapter three. Eleazar is not the seed son. He is yet to be born." Uh, chap, uh, chapter 15 verse 4 and behold the word of the Lord came to him saying this one shall not be your heir but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir now you notice he hasn't mentioned Sarai here I was just going to ask you that question yeah he has not mentioned Sarai here and so later on we see how that can be problematic when Sarai after oh I don't know nine years gives her handmaiden Hagar to her husband Abram as his wife. Okay, so my question is, at this point, God's talking to Abram. Right. At this point, does Abram believe it's going to come from his wife, his, his own wife? I can't tell you that for sure. But what I can tell you for sure is what's written on the, in the book. One who will come from your own body shall be your heir. So he's going to be the father. Right. Who's the mother? <laughs> well, you know, taking a, some translations call her a concubine, and that is not a concubine in the way that we think of as a concubine. A concubine in that day was defined as a secondary wife well gee I don't know Joanne well I mean you would think he'd not want that well I don't know Joanne <laughs> here's, a, here's a guy who was offered a young good looking Egyptian woman and his wife says she's your wife I don't know. Did they, I mean, back then they obviously did all that. Of course, of course they did. That was custom. That was custom. Yeah. So there, so I, I, I'm, I'm ill, I'm ill prepared and unwilling to attach any evil doing to the Hagar thing. I, I, well, some, some have uh, told me through my readings and commentaries that this is Eve all over again and where she should have been a help mate to her husband she wound up being a stumbling block to her husband and the result of that liaison was what was his name Ishmael So I don't know what was going through Abram's mind. Not that he was a red-blooded American male, but he was still a male. So I don't know what was going through his mind. He may have legitimately thought this is how God was going to work it out. I don't know. I wasn't there. Exactly. And I'm not prepared to put words in his mouth. I can read the story and I can give you some insight as it's been given to me but I'm you know we need to learn we need to learn as we read God's word when he's quiet we need to shut our cake holes too instead of making junk up because we're just going to get ourselves in trouble this one shall not be your heir 
Often God seems to delay his intervention until a situation becomes absolutely hopeless. Then a solution will have to be of his doing and the glory will go to him. Question? No, you don't. If you, ask, if you ask it, it's not a dumb question. If you leave without asking it, you've done a dumb thing. Yeah, so... So what, they're not going to be part of the marriage of the of God. They're going to be witnesses. They're going to be witnesses of, of the bride being married to the bridegroom. And so the Old Testament saints that um, died for the, I guess, the unborn ones, the people that have been saved, well, the Old, oh, never mind, I guess I answered that question. Okay. All right. Yeah, the, qu the question had to do with old saints being part of the uh, bride. And I don't, I don't see that. God can do whatever God wants to do. But I don't see that in the writings as I, go, as I go through them and as I read them. I don't see that. Because it talks about, at the marriage supper law of the Lamb, it talks about the guests. Is that the bride? No. <laughs> oh. So friends of the bride, right? Yeah. So who's it got to be? Got to be the Old Testament saints in my book. Now, we could be surprised. God can do whatever God wants to do. And I am sure there's going to be plenty of people in heaven that are going to be surprised when I walk through the door. How, how did you get here? And I will answer them the way Alistair Begg answered the question for the thief on the cross. If you haven't seen that video, look it up. When the thief on the cross got to heaven, he was, he was asked, what are you doing here? He says, I don't know. Well, on what basis are you here? Do you, are, are, you've never been to bat, as Alistair goes on, you, you haven't been baptized. You don't know anything about church membership. How'd you get here? I don't know. What, 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 and he goes like, oh, uh, uh, wait a minute. So he gets the supervisor angel. And the supervisor angel comes to the thief on the cross. He says, we just have a couple of questions. Now, are you, are you squared away on the doctrine of justification by faith? And the thief on the cross goes, never heard of it in all my life. Well, what about the doctrine of scripture? And the thief on the cross just stands there and looks at him with a stupid look on his face going. Then the supervisor angel finally asks him, on what authority are you here? And his response and our response, because the man on the middle cross said I could come. That's it. It's the only reason. Because of what he did. Not because of what we did. Okay, we've already talked about sonship. We talked about heirship. We've reasoned through this chapter. We're going to stop. It's 20 after. We'll start on verse 5 when we return. Any questions before we go? Oh, his or was his. It's referred to as a proper noun, right? You said it's servant. It's a proper noun here, right? Eleazar yeah. was the name of his chief servant. servant. Yeah. Yep. And the name means God's helper. Yeah. And so when Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit being another helper, we can rightly give him the moniker Eleazar. Yeah. Among, among many others. Anything else? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for these dear souls. We ask that you would protect us all, get us home safely to the comfort and warmth of our homes to which we are indebted to you. One man told me once we have won the lottery when it comes to countries to live in. 
Maybe so. But there, is, there are no words to explain how we feel our appreciation, our gratitude, our absolute astonishment that you picked us and gave us life and bought us out of the kingdom of darkness, brought us into the kingdom of light, and adopted us as your sons and allowed us to call you Father. We stand in awe. We come because the man on the middle cross said we could. Amen.